So it's always great to come here and this is today. I heard a lot of uh, exciting stories both from uh, old friends and from people I hadn't met before and I thank you all for uh, sharing your, your uh, scientific research stories with me and I thank the students for uh, organizing this and for eating pizza with me. Uh, at lunch, and we had a good conversation there as well. I've only been back in Colorado since um, uh, April, uh, having lived in Washington, D.C. for the last 10 years, and uh, I'm really enjoying the lack of humidity and the lack of traffic. Uh, although Washington is an exciting place, I uh, did enjoy being there, but I thought that 10 years was enough and that it was time to uh, get back to where real work was being done instead of just administering the work of other people. And so um, certainly they put me to work immediately upon getting back, um, although I did take off last week and went downhill skiing three days and snowshoeing one day in the central Rockies, so, it, so uh, it hasn't all been work. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to just talk about recent Research. So I'm not going to talk about the discovery of catalytic RNAs, which was discovered in Boulder, Colorado, 1982, um, but we've moved on from, from that. And so what I'm going to talk about today is crawling out of that RNA world and talk about um, the following scenario, which is thought that maybe there was a time when life on Earth consisted of primitive cells where RNA, because of its ability to be both a biocatalyst and a, an informational molecule or a genome, that there was an RNA world where RNA was performing both functions. But clearly there came a time when proteins came into the scene. These may at first have been short peptides which were not made by message directed protein synthesis, but a key moment came when RNA learned how to reproducibly make the proteins that would best bind to it and increase its versatility and enhance its function. And this part of the story, this RNP world, ribonucleoprotein world, is not hypothetical because clearly there are major biocatalysts in us and in all of life on Earth such as the ribosome, which is responsible for all of protein synthesis on this planet, that have this intimate collaboration between ribonucleic acid and polypeptide. And then there uh, was a further step in this pathway, which is that uh, protein enzymes now have taken over most of biocatalysis, but perhaps the uh, nucleotide cofactors that many of them carry around to facilitate biocatalysis. Maybe these are molecular fossils and reminding us of a time when the uh, RNA was, was a much larger part of the spectrum of how catalysis takes place. So this is a, an evolu evolutionary scenario uh, from an RNA world, but Similar to this pathway, our lab has also sort of crawled out of this RNA world. And we've quit working on the catalytic RNAs and are now working on these ribonucleoprotein enzymes. Specifically, uh, most of the people in the lab work on this enzyme, telomerase, which, as you recall, got the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine uh, just a few months ago. Uh, the work of Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider, uh, in particular, was responsible for uh, elucidating this uh, fact that this was a ribonucleoprotein enzyme and that the RNA, among other activities, carried around with it the template that 
uh, specify the sequence of the DNA at the end of the chromosome. And so this enzyme solves what is called the end replication problem of linear chromosomes. If, you, if you're in the middle part of a chromosome and you're a DNA polymerase, there's always, because the DNA is double-stranded, a complementary strand that can be used as a template for DNA synthesis. When you get to the very end of the chromosome, there isn't a, a second strand that can be used. And because DNA replication starts with an RNA primer, which is then extended and the RNA part is removed, there would be expected to be, and in fact, many labs have shown this, there's a shrinking chromosome problem if you don't have a mechanism of maintaining the ends. With each replicative cycle, the chromosome end gets smaller and smaller due to this end replication problem, due to nucleases which resect the end of the chromosome. And so this telomerase uh, compensates for that by building out the chromosome end. The uh, process is to add, to copy this short region of the RNA. Uh, this particular sequence is that of Tetrahymena thermophila, which was the first organism in which Blackburn and Greider discovered telomerase. And then when the end of the template is reached, this uh, sequence can ratchet back and rebind. Uh, this last TTG can rebind in this position, and then it can be extended again. And so it polymerizes, ratchets back, translocates, realigns, does it again, and it can do multiple rounds of this DNA end replication. The other player in this, uh, the, the protein that is responsible for catalyzing the DNA end replication, uh, was discovered in my lab in 1996 by Joachim Lindner, a postdoctoral fellow who's now back in his own lab in Switzerland. And uh, we named it TERT for telomerase reverse transcriptase. And as you'll see a little later, it has canonical reverse transcriptase motifs, as would be found in, for example, HIV reverse transcriptase. And this makes a lot of sense because what does a reverse transcriptase do? It uses a, an RNA template to synthesize DNA. And what does telomerase have to do? Well, it has to use this RNA template to synthesize DNA. So the questions for today are, uh, what does this RNA do beyond just this templating function? What are the structures and functions of the parts of the TERT that are not the reverse transcriptase active site motif, because it's pretty obvious what it's doing in the reaction. It's catalyzing the addition of these nucleotides. But you see that the protein is considerably larger than that and has some interesting telomerase-specific functions. And then we'll move from the telomerase to the thing upon which it acts, which is the chromosome end itself, which is called the telomere. Telomere is Greek. Telos means end, and mere means like thing or stuff or something like that. So this is the stuff at the end of the chromosome. And how can the telomeric end proteins regulate telomerase is really the subject of our current research, and depending on time, I may or may not get to that very far into that story. <coughs> So for many of these experiments, we use the yeast system, the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, because it allows us to do both uh, biochemistry and also genetics uh, on the same system, and to test in vivo some of the ideas that come from our in vitro experiments. The the use of the yeast system was inhibited for a long time because we didn't know the structure of the yeast telomerase RNA. And it looks very faint from where I'm, well, it's sort of faintly there in the background. It should be a little darker. But this um, RNA molecule folds up in a, a very, really unusual way for RNA. And that is it has these three long arms coming out of this central region. 
Looks